stronger and do more for the Lord or more faithful, maybe in their Bible reading, their prayer life, uh, church attendance, and so forth. What makes the difference in that? What's the situation that causes something to happen in one person's life and it does not the other? Uh, if I were to have you raise your hand this morning, uh, I would probably say a good percentage of you folks would say, yes, I know the Lord. And you would say, come on, a it's called A-M-E-N. A -M -E -N. <laughs> All right. Anyway, salvation is very important in a lot of times people, they don't move beyond that word, salvation. They don't get the full scope of really what the Lord has done. Now, I had a, uh, uh, a screen presentation here I wanted to show you this morning because I think that we don't get the full impact of really what salvation is all about. We've been, uh, last few weeks, we've been talking about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We've celebrated it, uh, some different than others. We try to get the full impact of really what salvation is all about through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. But I'm convinced here is a difference. Listen very carefully. Here's a difference between a person who we call a spiritual mature individual and a person who, uh, yes, they're saved, they're on the way to heaven, but they're not enjoying really the Christian life. They sometimes feel that uh, it's an obligation, they have to go to church. Uh, church is not an obligation to me, it's a privilege. Amen. But we don't get the full scope, I think it's because of a lack of understanding. The Bible says, in the book of uh, Amos, it says, my people were destroyed for a lack of knowledge. And I began to think about that this past week, and the Holy Spirit began to speak to my heart uh, about this matter of what is, needs to be taught, what needs to be really driven home to people's life. So I want you to take your Bible this morning, turn to the book of uh, Romans chapter 5, and I'm going to look at 11 verses with you this morning. I hope that we'll begin to uh, illuminate. I, I may uh, continue a series on this, but as you look up here on the screen, you'll notice that I have a big box uh, that has salvation. I put the word salvation three times, representing the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and I'm kind of that kind of person. But um, then I have some small boxes that has some names on them that many times you look at the words and you don't quite grasp them to see how they fit into your life in regards to the matter of salvation. And I believe this is where a lot of Christians do not get motivated more to, as God told the people of Israel, to love the Lord their God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. Because we don't really get the impact of what those words really mean. We read them in the Bible all the time. We see them, but we don't connect them with principles that God wants to be uh, pulling into our lives to help us to become the kind of Christian he wants us to be. After all, the main objective that God wants after we're saved is to prepare us for heaven. Now, are you going to be a miserable person in heaven? I don't think you will, but you can be a lot more miserable down here before you get to heaven because you're not enjoying all the things that God wants you to enjoy. It's like the man who took a flight to a certain city on the airplane and uh, he, was, he had gotten hungry. And he saw all these people, you know, getting things, and uh, he, he thought, well, this is going to cost me more money, so I'm not going to ask for it, I'm not going to receive it, I'm not going to take it. And later on, he was so hungry, he said, uh, let me ask you, how much does it cost for those extra little things, you know, the, uh, the drink and the food and so forth? And he says, nothing. It's already been paid through when you paid for your fare. You see, that's what I think is happening to a lot of Christians. You have missed out on the fact you think you're going to have to do more for this and do more for that and do more for this and do more for that when it's included in the package of salvation. All these things come out of salvation that God has provided for you and me. 
So look here, if you would, at Romans chapter 5, and I want to uh, go very quickly here because I'm going to lose uh, the time that I want to give to you this morning. But I think that we have forgotten or we don't get the principle of what Jesus really accomplished when he died upon the cross and provided salvation for you and me. After all, Luke 19.10 says this, For the Son of Man is come to do what? Seek Come on, say it out loud. And save that which is lost. That was his objective. Because he knew mankind had no hope, had no rescue without his salvation. All the things that God gave in the Old Testament, uh, the, uh, the sacrificial lamb and so forth and so on, was to point towards that principle of God providing salvation, but much more than that. You see, God didn't save you just to be miserable. He saved, saved you to give you a, a security and assurance. And, of course, Paul talks more about that here in the chapter, about some other things that God wants you to do. You see, God doesn't want us just to be happy Christians. He wants us to be joyful Christians. Amen. See, Amen. I'm afraid there's a lot of Christians that miss the boat. They've missed really the goodness of God because they haven't got a hold of it. And so I think the chapter 5 of Romans kind of lets us in on a few of these things, though we'll not be able to cover them all. But look at chapter 5 and verse 1. You're familiar with verse 1 probably more than any of the other verses in there except verse 8. It says, therefore, now, if you were to look back at chapter 4, you would kind of get an illustration of what he's about ready to say through a person's life by the name of Abraham and David and some of the others that he mentions in the chapter. Now, look at verse 1, if you see there, it says, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. In those two single verses alone, we've seen some tremendous truths. Number one there, he says, uh, the, the principle of faith brings about these things that I've just mentioned. Faith, how do we get it? Well, if you go to chapter 10, verse 17, it says, so then faith, say it with me, so then faith cometh by what? And hearing by the word of God. Faith is an important principle for everything in our life because it is the beginning of great things that God wants to open up to your life. But it doesn't stop there. He says, look, how about this matter of peace? Peace is a tremendous thing. And we'll talk more about it in just a few, uh, few seconds here. He says, peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have access. That's a great principle we talked about last week. We have access into the very throne of God. We're able to pray because Jesus made the way. See? And by the way, he is the way. Amen. By the way, he's the only way. Amen. The access. But wait a minute, he goes a little bit further. He talks about grace. Do you realize that grace is the principle whereby that uh, you and I are able to be claimed uh, the sons of God? For by grace are you what? Amen. Through what? Amen. And not of your? It is what? The gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Grace. You get saved by grace. Here's one for you. You die by grace. Huh? And by the way, don't try to push it. God's not going to give you that grace until he's ready for you to go out of here. He knows the beginning from the end. Grace is something that you begin with in your Christian walk, and it's something you end with, so don't worry about it in all but things between. Hey, everything going on in the world, God's grace is still what? Sufficient. All right? Now, those are just some thoughts that I want to get across to you. But look down to the next verse. I'm going to read this and I'm going to get into the message here very quickly. Verse 3. And only so, but we glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, experience hope, and hope maketh not a shame, because the love of God is been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. You don't have to pay anything for it. You don't have to try to, you know, <laughs> a lot of people, want, they say, boy, you, got, you don't want to get, you got to get this, you got to do this and do this. No, 
The Holy Ghost is a gift too. And by the way, it's in the package when you get saved. See? The Holy Spirit comes to dwell within your life. And hopefully you're saying, take full control of my life. The Bible calls it being filled with the Holy Spirit from the book of Ephesians. Now, look at the next verse here. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man would even, uh, would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love towards us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Hey, listen. If he was for you before you were saved, when you were a sinner, let me tell you something, Christian. He's for you now. And if God be for us, who can be against us, the Bible tells us. But look at the next verse. Get I hope I'm getting you excited. Come on, get a smile on your face. Get excited. Say amen. amen. Boy, I love hearing that. Uh, by the way, uh, uh, you know, amen, amen, and amen. All right? Now look at the next verse. He says, but much more. He says, listen, if you've gotten excited about the previous verses, get excited about this. Much more being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy, hey, Get beyond that point. Don't be sad. Be glad because you can have the joy of the Lord. And the joy of the Lord is our what? Our strength. See, you want to take and live life in the strength of the Lord, get it through the joy of the Lord. Now look back here. Not only so, but also... We also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom we have now received the atonement. Now, in those 11 verses are some words that I'm going to point out in just a few minutes that I hope you'll get a hold of. Because if you ever get a hold of them, they will literally change your life by the power of the Holy Spirit. Would you pray with me, please? With every head bowed and every eye closed, let me ask you this morning a very important question. What accomplishment have you made in your life that's going to be or has been life-changing not only now, but for eternity. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for what you accomplished through your Son, Jesus Christ, which is life-changing now and for eternity. And so I pray this morning, if there be one that has slipped into this auditorium who's never been born again, who's never truly come to know what it is to become a child of God by faith in Jesus Christ, I pray that to the end of the message, that person will trust you. I pray for Christians to get a grip on things that we would become more than just the average Christian, but truly the Christian you want us to be by the power of the Holy Spirit. May thy will be done in this hour. And Lord, we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. There were many accomplishments that have been made up through history by many people. I mean, we could go down the line today as far as the accomplishments of great men and great women have contributed to our society and, and those things that they have done. That's great. But the accomplishments that Jesus did while on earth, we could begin to name them. Yes, he turned water into wine. I, I, I didn't see anybody else do that. Now, I mean, they could take the ingredients, you know, that they get and, and let it ferment and so forth and be there. But Jesus took ordinary water and turned it into wine. Do you believe that? Amen. He did. While he was here on earth, he healed the people that he came in contact with. He healed an official's son. That's great. And he didn't even have to go to his house to do it. How about that? Didn't have to touch him, anything. He says, he'll be made whole. He was made whole. That was a great accomplishment. Uh, he met some lepers one day and uh, uh, that had, had leprosy. And he said, go to the priest and do what I tell you to do and you'll be healed. Guess what? All 10 of them were healed. Not just one. Not just eight, but all ten were healed. Great accomplishment. Great average, huh? Great average. 
Jesus did that. He accomplished that. He raised some people from the dead. I haven't seen anybody do that lately, have you? Huh? You know why? In him was the life, and the life was the light of men. Jesus accomplished that for his glory, for his honor. He raised Lazarus from the dead. He said, Lazarus, come forth. Did you ever think about this? If Jesus hadn't used the name Lazarus, guess what? Every person that was dead would come back to life. Why? That's the power that Jesus had. The accomplishment he brought about. And he wants to do that for people. Recently I read a story called Look Beyond the Package. Very intriguing. A young man was getting ready to graduate from college and for months, he admired a beautiful sports car that in a, in a, in a local business that he'd really like to have. And, uh, and knowing his father could well afford it, he told him that, Dad, that's all I want. You don't have to buy me anything else. I, I'd like to have that sports car. And so as graduation day approached, the young man awaited signs that his father had purchased the car. Well, finally on the morning of his graduation, his father called him to a, into his private study. And there his father told him how proud he was to have such a fine son. A beautiful son that had obeyed and listened and so forth to him. And he, he appreciated it. Well, on the desk was a package that his father had there. And the son was very curious about that package on there. His father reached over and picked up the package and gave it to his son. And his son opened it up, very excited, but inside the box, inside the package, was a Bible. His son got disgusted and threw it to the side and said, with all your money, you could have at least did one request that I asked you to do. And the son just left. Well, sometimes later, some years passed and the young man was very successful in his business after he graduated from college and went out. He had a beautiful home, wonderful family. But he realized his father was getting very old. And he hadn't seen him since that day that he threw the Bible to the side and just left his father without talking to him anymore and had no communication with him whatsoever. Before he could see his father, though, he received news that his father had passed away. So the next news he received was that he had inherited everything that his father owned. And so when he arrived at his father's house, sudden sadness and regret began to well up into his heart and he began to search through his father's important papers and when he did he saw the Bible that he had thrown aside and so he picked up the Bible and as he opened up the Bible he began to turn the pages and his father had carefully underlined certain verses there in the Bible especially one verse that really grasped his eyes and that was Matthew 7 11 that states this and if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father, which is in heaven, give to those who ask him? And as that son, as he read those words, he tilted the Bible, and out of that Bible dropped a set of keys. And as he began to look at those keys, he noticed a note there that was attached to the keys, it was a tag, with the dealer's name, the same dealer who had the sports car he had desired, and on the tag was the date of his graduation and the words, paid in full. The problem with that young man is the same problem with some of you folks this morning. You've thrown aside the Bible. You've thrown aside the teachings of the scriptures. And because you wanted your way or you want your way, you miss out not only on the thing that you desire, but many of the other things that God wants to give you. And you have not seen the full picture of what God has done for you represented 
in all the other boxes that God has for your life. So for the next 10 minutes, I want your full undivided attention. And I want to share with you some very important principles. And if you look back here at chapter 5, I want you to look down at verse number 10. There's a word there that's very vital to your life. And that is the word reconciliation. Now why did God give us that word reconciliation? Well if I were to have you to turn back to the book of Ephesians chapter 2 and I'll not have you turn there this morning, this morning the Bible tells us that you and I were dead in our trespasses and sins. If you were to leaf on through there you'd find out that you were an enemy of God as also told about here in Romans chapter 5. We were enemies of God. And in order for God to take care of that problem, he had to literally let his son, Jesus Christ, become his enemy. And he turned his back upon his own son and let him die upon the cross to pay for your sins. So you and I could be reconciled to God, that we could come back to God because of Adam and Eve's making that wall between us and God. You see, reconciliation is very important. Imagine this morning two friends, and they have got in a fight or an argument. The good relationship they once enjoyed is strained to the point of breaking, and they speak to know not each other anymore. They have parted their waves, and the friends gradually become strangers. And such estrangement can only be reversed if there's reconciliation. To be reconciled is to be restored to friendship or harmony. When old friends resolve their differences and restore their relationships, reconciliation has occurred. Would you take your Bible and turn to the book of 2 Corinthians with me, please? Look at chapter 5. Just a few chapters over from your book of Romans. 2 Corinthians chapter, look at it, 2 Corinthians, very quickly, chapter 5. And look down there at verse number 18 and 19, if you would, please. It says, and all things are of God. That's a tremendous thought right there. Maybe I'll preach on that sometime. Who hath not, who may be, but who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. You see, we were alienated from God, but God says through my son Jesus Christ, I'm going to patch up the situation. I'm going to take care of things. You see, God is not against you. God is for you. Amen. Why? Because of reconciliation. You see, sometimes we picture God with a big baseball bat ready to hit us over the head. That is far from the truth. I see a heavenly father ready to take us in his, in his arms and pick us up and love us. Amen. For God so loved the world. Huh? In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so the Bible says here, turn back to the book of uh, Romans chapter 5, if you would. It says, look, verse number 10, for if when we were enemies, we were enemies of God, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Now, not only does he reconcile us, but he also, back in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it says, he's made us individuals who become ones who spread the message of reconciliation. You see, God does not want to be at odds with anybody. You see, he's not willing that any should perish. Do you believe that? Amen. He's not willing to a person go to die and go to hell because of the fact of reconciliation. Jesus didn't want to do that in vain. And if you're still at odds with God, it isn't God's fault. It's your problem. It's your fault. 
because he's made a way through his son, Jesus Christ. Reconciliation through the fact of him dying upon the cross. See, Christian reconciliation is a glorious truth. You and I have the opportunity of spreading that to other people and telling them, hey, God doesn't want to be at odds with you. Think about this. How many of you remember Madeline Murray or Hera? Raise your hand. The atheist. Do you know what? One day she stood and she shook her fist in the hand of God and says, God, I dare you to strike me dead. Could have God struck her dead? Did God strike her dead? No. Now she is dead now because of the fact that the Bible says it's pointing that a man wants to die. See, she died. But the fact of the matter is God didn't strike her dead. You know why? Reconciliation. God cares for you. And he wants you to be reconciled to him. And he provides the way through his son, Jesus Christ. So, reconciliation. But reconciliation is important because it brings about peace. Look back at verse 1. It says, therefore, being justified by faith, we have what? Peace with God. That's reconciliation right there. It's a peace treaty between you and God. And it was brought about through the person of Jesus Christ. So here's what God's doing today. He's walking over and he's saying, here's the treaty. It's up to you to receive it. Everything's all right with me, but how about you? God wants you to understand reconciliation. And it's through his son, Jesus Christ, that brings peace in your heart. Now, stop right there. There's a difference between the peace with God and the peace of God. You see, first of all, the Christian has both of them now. Huh? He's not only made his peace with God, but he has the peace of God that passeth on understanding that Paul talks about in Philippians chapter 4. You can't have either one of them till you're willing to say, Lord, I believe your son Jesus died for my sins and I want to receive him as my own personal savior. But wait a minute, there's another word. Would you look down at verse number eight? It says, but God commendeth his love towards us and that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. He did what we call redemption. Redemption means to buy back. You see, because of Adam Eve's sin, it took and sold us unto sin. Evil and the devil, the flesh and the world. But redemption is buying us back. It's like the old story in the Old Testament in the book of Hosea. Hosea was a prophet of God. And he married a woman that he bought off of the, what should I say, the um, auction block. A prostitute, a harlot. God says, I want you to be this individual's husband. Guess what happened? Gomer, time after time, would just leave her husband, Hosea. It was a picture of the people of Israel who Israel pictured Gomer or Gomer pictured Israel and Hosea pictured God. Time after time Israel would leave God and go into idol worship and commit all kinds of sin. But God just kept coming back. Huh? Isn't that just like he does for you and me? Amen. How far we go, God still is concerned about us. Finally, time after time, Hosea would go. And there she would be up on the auction block. And he'd pay the money to receive her back. You see, Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He did what? He washed it white as snow. Amen. Folks, that's what redemption does. That means you do not have to keep going back and buying because the Bible says he died once for our sins. Amen? Amen. 
We don't have to keep paying for them, doing this. You know, some people say, well, I just can't keep up with all this that God wants me to do. Listen, he paid the price once. You read back, we don't have time this morning to go back to the book of Hebrews chapter 10. But the Bible says, you know, he paid the price once. He wasn't going to be like back in the Old Testament. Well, they took these little lambs, and year after year after year after year after year, they had to bring those lamb sacrifices and so forth, which could never, the Bible says, take away sin. But Jesus paid the price once, final. That's why he said on the cross. Come on, say it with me. It is finished. Cash on the barrel head. Paid for in full by his precious blood. That's what redemption means in the Bible. We talked last week a little bit about the matter of justification. You go back to the verse 1, but I want you to look down at verse number 9, if you would please. Much more being now justified by his what? Now look here. Justified by, by faith through his blood with God through Jesus Christ. God wants us to get a hold of this principle of justification. It means to declare not guilty. We're no longer guilty through Jesus Christ. Aren't you glad about that? Yes. Nothing can be brought, about, brought against you once you are saved because the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses from all sin. You see, it's an active thing. John said it very good there in 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, say it with me, cleanse us from all sin. You see, it's a declaration. It's a matter of fact, justification is a legal term that could be used in a court of law. It's a declaration of the fact that we'll never be held accountable again for the fact of our sins. Now, unless you get a wrong concept there, Paul talked about this in Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. And some Christians, they got the wrong spin on things. And that is they think, well, I'm saved. Now, I can go out and do anything I want to do. No, 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 no. It says, brethren... You've been called unto liberty. Only use not your liberty as an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. You see, God knows what sin can do to our lives. So he wants us to understand. He wants us to realize the forgiveness that we have through him. Look back at verse 9 again. Much more... Then being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Not maybe saved from wrath, but shall be saved from wrath. See, hey, I'm on my way. Are you? See, absent from the body, present with the Lord. That is the forgiveness and the justification that God gives us through His Son, Jesus Christ. But if you would take and look at a very important word in verse number 11. Before I close this morning, and I'm, I, I can't be finished. It's too deep, too far extending as the box is represented up here on the screen. In verse 11 is a word that's so vital for our lives. Not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now notice those first words. And not only so. Then he says, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom we have now, not in the future, but now receive the atonement. You see, the atonement there mentioned in verse 11 is the sin bearer that separated us uh, from the Father was completely done away with through the atonement. And time doesn't permit us this morning, but if we were to go back to the book of Leviticus, we could look at the fact of the, uh, uh, the Jewish holiday there called the Day of Atonement. And each year they celebrate this. 
You see, God said, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes an atonement for the soul. Amen. If you're dependent upon anything else to get you to heaven, friend, except the atonement of the blood of Jesus Christ, you're not going to make it. Amen. I don't care if you got Baptist smacked all over your face. You'll not get to heaven outside the atonement of Jesus Christ. Amen. You see, I believe because of what the Bible says that men and women are regenerated, redeemed, reconciled to God, justified, forgiven, adopted. Not by the doctrine, are you listening? Not by the doctrine of atonement, but by the atonement itself. The atonement take, takes care of everything. God wants us to understand that. You see, John 1.12 says this. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God to them that believe on his name. You see, there's only one power. I want to close with this story and drive this point home. And I read about this recently and it really challenged me. Now, I'm not a big ice cream lover. Now, if you want to find somebody who loves ice cream, there she sits. <laughs> And there's probably a lot of others around here. Come on, let's fess up this morning. Raise your hand. I love ice cream. Come on, say it. I No, I don't love ice cream, so I can't really say that, all right? Give me a bag of potato chips. Yeah. <laughs> but I was reading this, I thought it was very interesting. And until more recent times, Mexico was the only producer of vanilla. I didn't know that. In the 1520s, a man by the name of Hernan Cortez traveled down to Mexico because he loved vanilla. So he brought some back with him to Europe, and for the next 300 years, the Europeans tried, but were never able and were never successful to take and to produce vanilla. You see, vanilla grows up, a tree is a vine, and eventually the vine produces an orchid. And in order to make the vanilla bean, the orchid must be what we call, in everything that we have, pollinated. But not just pollinated, but just anything. The problem is, it only blooms one morning. Are you listening? One morning per year to be pollinated. If it isn't pollinated within 12 hours, it withers. To make things more difficult, a hood-like membrane covers the part of the vanilla orchid that produces pollen. This makes the production of the vanilla bean very difficult. But in 1836, a man by the name of Charles Francos Antonio Moran traveled down to Mexico to figure out why they weren't able to produce vanilla beans there in Europe. As Moran was studying the vanilla orchids, his attention was drawn to a little bee, the Mexican Pelopona bee. This bee landed on the orchid, lifted up the little hood like membrane, collected pollen, and then flew off to the next flower. This bee was pollinating the orchids. After some time, the orchid produced a vanilla bean, and to this day, the Mexican melopona bee is the only, are you listening? Is the only insect that's able to pollinate that orchid. Folks, I have something to say to you this morning. God is the only one to pollinate your life to bring salvation. Amen. The power of God. That's why Paul said, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also the Greek. In that salvation, God has said, There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And that name is Jesus. And by the way, folks, 
It's the same power that keeps you and me that Paul talked about, excuse me, Peter talked about, who are kept by the power of God unto salvation. You and I cannot accomplish what only God can accomplish. But when you are willing to take the, make the choice and accept it by faith, God gives you salvation. Then all these other things you're able to begin to understand what God has done for you and for those who love Him. You see, God wants you to understand. He doesn't want you to be destroyed. He wants you to go to heaven. But He wants you to go to heaven rejoicing in the life that He's given you here now. He that will love life and live long days, let him refrain himself from evil. And when you look at all these things that we have seen in the boxes, and you begin to look at the things I just put up here, God wants to do that for your life if you'll make the choice. Would you stand with me with heads bowed and eyes closed? Everyone standing? Every head bowed and every eye closed this morning. What did he accomplish for you? Are you listening? Everything that you need in your life, you don't have to go chasing after all kinds of things in the world, for in Jesus dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily and everything that you need for your life. If you will choose him today, Father in heaven, we thank you for your provision. And I pray that this morning, these folks that sit before me and those who are watching by means of internet will simply be willing to make that choice. Number one, to trust you as Savior. Number two, to trust you daily in your, their life. To trust in their heart that you'll lead, you'll direct, You'll meet each need, and you'll help meet everything that they're searching for because it's found in your Son, Jesus Christ. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you look up this way, please?